So what do you do when things don't go how you expect? What do you do when things don't go how you expect? Sometimes it's big things. Sometimes it's little things. Uh, I remember a time not long ago where I, uh, I had poured myself a drink and I thought it was cooled off and I took a big sip and it was still boiling hot. Not what I expected. Boiling hot, you know, drink pouring down my throat. Spit it out as fast as you can. The damage is done. Wasn't what I expected. And I reacted. What do you do when things don't go how you expect? Or imagine you, you grab an apple, take a big bite, and you weren't paying attention. It wasn't an apple and it was like an onion. All right, I'm going to react to that. What do you do when things don't go how you expect? Sometimes it's silly things. Sometimes it's bigger things. Sometimes it's good things. Anybody's, anybody's life in here start to change last night? Anybody have a good night last night? God start to move in this place? How many of you expected that, right? I, my guess is for a lot of you, you came here last night and you thought you were going to have a good conference, thought you were going to have a good week, and you're excited and glad to be here and all that stuff. But coming forward and pulling a lever, maybe it's not what you expected. Sometimes it's a good thing. What are you doing? Things don't go how you expect. And God changes things. And God changes course on you. Sometimes, though, a lot of times, it's not good. It's not a good thing. Things don't go how you expect. You have this experience that's so great. You have this experience up on the mountain. At some point, you've got to come down. And it's maybe not quite what you expected. That's where we find Elijah here this morning. Just like a lot of you last night, just like a lot of us, Elijah had an experience up on the mountain. And he saw God in a way he'd never seen him before. God moved powerfully. He had an encounter with the living God. And so did 850 other people. And so did King Ahab. Had this huge encounter with the living God. Things seem to be changing. Elijah, I think, is thinking things are shifting. But at some point, you've got to come down off the mountain. And when Elijah does, it's not what he expected. Hey, turn to 1 Kings. 1 Kings chapter 19. That's where we're going to be today. 1 Kings chapter 19. We're going to follow up on this story of Elijah and see what Elijah does. We're going to see what happens to Elijah, what God does when things don't go how Elijah expected. 1 Kings chapter 19, and we'll start in verse 1. So like we saw last night, there's that incredible encounter up on the mountain. It seems like things have shifted. God shows up. The prophets of Baal and Asherah are put to shame. There's no chance. God is real. God has the power. Baal and Asherah have none of it. God shows up. The sacrifice is burnt up. And Elijah, like Brad just got done telling us, Elijah tells King Ahab, hey, basically King Ahab, he didn't say all this, but I think he's thinking it. Ahab, you've been behind all this bad stuff. Like you, you've been, you know, pushing the worship of Baal. You've been pushing idol worship. You've been pushing this evil on the people. But Ahab, you just saw with your own eyes what happened. You just saw it. So now Ahab, you know the truth. You know what's real. You know things need to change. You know things need to get back on track. You know that the train was moving this way, Ahab, because you led it that way. But we pulled a lever and shifted the tracks and now we're heading this way. So Elijah tells Ahab, hey man, get back down the hill because it's time for things to change. And I think Elijah's got in his mind, it's about time to lead a revival up in here. I think Elijah's thinking it's time for the nation of Israel to get back on track. Ahab's going to lead it because he just saw the truth. I'm going to be his right-hand man. Things are changing. We're going back down the hill. And here's what it says in 1 Kings 19 and verse 1. Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done. Ahab gets back to the palace in a place called Jezreel, which is kind of the vacation palace of the king and queen. So Ahab gets gets back there and says, Jezebel, honey, you're never going to believe it. Guess what I just saw? He tells Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he'd killed all the prophets with the sword. So you see, it sounds to me like Ahab's like, see, isn't that crazy? Things have got to be different. You never believe what I just saw. But look how fast it changes. Verse 2, so Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, good job, congratulations, everything's going to change from now on. Is that what it says? No. She sent a messenger to say, may the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, which is basically an ancient fancy way of saying, I promise, by this time tomorrow, I do not make your life like one of them. In other words, Elijah, I'm going to kill you. That's what she says. Elijah and Ahab come back down the mountain after experiencing the power of God. I think Elijah, at least for sure, is ready for things to change. He's ready for the track to shift. He's ready to move the train in the right direction. Ahab, it seems like to me, comes home and says, Honey, you're never going to believe it. This is incredible. Guess what happened? And just that fast, Jezebel says, Nuh-uh. It's not changing. 
Elijah thinks things are going to shift. They don't shift. Ahab thinks maybe it's a new day in the kingdom. It's not. Ahab thinks he's going to lay change. He won't. Elijah thinks he's going to lead a revival. He's not going to. Just that fast, things completely change on them. Or, or as Michael Scott would say, my, how the turntables. It's not what they expect. Not what they expect. So here's what I want you to get here in just these first couple of verses. Can I bring this? I want to bring this home to you. Maybe especially for some of you who last night, some change in your life started. You came forward and pulled a lever, had a big moment, the Spirit's moving. Change started for you last night. Here's what I want to ask you. I just want to ask you, like, like Ahab and Jezebel in this story, who do you take advice from? I just want to ask you, who do you take advice from? Because let me tell you, nothing will derail you faster from getting on the path God wants you on. Nothing will derail you faster than taking advice from, than living your life by the ideas of people who aren't going to help you follow Jesus. Nothing can derail that faster. I think we see that right here with Ahab. Ahab, it seems to me, is ready to lead some change. But he gets home and says, Jezebel, it's going to be great. And that one person in his life says, no. Do you know how much change gets led in the nation of Israel? Who do you take advice from? I think this gets hard for us sometimes because right, rightfully so, this is a big deal. We cannot be, we must not be as Christians, as followers of Jesus, as the people of God, we cannot be so isolated in ourselves that we'd have no contact with the world. We cannot be so separated from everybody else who doesn't yet know Jesus. We can't do that. We have to be in the world. We have to be influential. Jesus called us salt and light. That means we season, we change, we bring light into darkness. Of course you need to have non-Christian friends. Of course you need to engage people at your school who don't know Jesus. Of course we need to be around people who don't follow God yet. Of course. My question isn't, do you ever have contact with people who don't know Jesus? My question is, who do you take advice from? And I think that's where the line gets blurry for us sometimes. Of course have friends who don't know Jesus. Please, by all means, Jesus had friends who didn't know Jesus. Do that. But who do you take advice from? Because the minute you start letting people have influence in your life, influence in your decisions, influence in your choices, influence in the way you look and dress and act and talk and think, now you're back on the wrong track. Who do you take advice from? Because here in this story, it changes that fast. Who do you take advice from? Let's keep reading. Verse 3. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, that's about 100 miles away. So this isn't just like, I'm a little scared. I'm going to go hide in the corner. This is like, I'm a little scared. I'm getting out of town, like a long way away. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. So he goes another several miles, even further, into the wilderness. Like he is hiding out, hiding out. He's terrified. He came to a broom bush, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. So let's talk about these verses here just for a minute. So Elijah, it says, was afraid. We talked about this. We talked about this some yesterday. You've seen it in the story of Elijah, how quickly, how often God speaks and Elijah acts, right? We've talked about that. God says, Elijah, go, and Elijah goes. God says, Elijah, speak, and Elijah speaks. God says, Elijah, do this, and Elijah does it right away. But you notice what happens here? Jezebel says something. Elijah's afraid, and he ran. This is the same guy who just prayed that prayer up on Mount Carmel when the fire fell from heaven and burned up the sacrifice. This is the same guy. This is the same guy who confronted Ahab on his own turf and said, there's going to be a famine. There's going to be no food, no rain. Same guy. This bold prophet, this courageous guy, this guy standing his ground for the name of God. This guy standing his ground for the worship of God. Same guy, bold prophet. The guy who's up on the mountain leading the change. The guy who's, who's praising and worshiping with the best of him. The guy who's got his hands raised singing. Same guy. One person threatens and he runs. You see how fast his faith turns to fear? And here's the thing, for, for all of us, we're going to have experiences where we're up on the mountain and God seems so real and God seems so close and God seems so powerful. And we'll think while we're here, while we're up on the mountain, 
I, I would never change anything about this. I'm going to go home and be stronger and better than ever. I'm going to go home and lead change. I'm going to go home and remember this mountaintop experience. I'm going back down into the Jezreel Valley, and things are going to be different. We all think that. We all want that. I think Elijah thought it too. You see how fast his faith turns to fear? So let me just warn us what I see here from the story of Elijah that I think we can take home to at the end of this week is this, that faith turns to fear when our approval comes from people. Faith turns to fear when our approval comes from people. So can I just ask you, where's your approval come from? Whose opinion matters the most to you? Who do you want to like you best? Who do you want to love you most? Who are you trying to impress? Who are you trying to please? Whose attention are you trying to get? Because your faith will turn to fear when your approval comes from people. Always. If it can happen to Elijah, who led the Mount Carmel revival, it can happen to you here in Johnson City, Tennessee. Faith turns to fear when your approval comes from people. And we see Elijah now at this point of despair. I mean, this is despair. That he gets to this point where he's like hiding under a bush, just trying to get in some shade out in the desert and saying, God, I would just rather be dead. I'd just rather be dead. Elijah's had it. He's done. He's toast. Despair. He doesn't know if there's any hope. He doesn't know if there's any chance. His faith from up on the mountain has completely turned to fear. Where's your approval come from? Elijah doesn't get the approval of one person. And it's fear. And it's running. And it's hiding. And it's over. If Elijah's approval, if Elijah's affirmation, if Elijah's identity, if Elijah's source of truth and strength, if Elijah's anchor is the power of God, then what does he have to be afraid of? I mean, remember what he's just experienced. Like, we had an incredible night in here last night. You've had incredible times of worship. You've experienced God before. I I saw the hands on the first night of how many of you have been to a MOVE conference before. It's a lot of you. You've been to these things before. You've experienced the presence of God before. You know how good it is. Elijah was up on the mountain. He experienced it. What? Tell me what does he have to be afraid of? When he gets back off the mountain, he just saw God, something I've never seen. He just saw God send fire from heaven and burn up something that was sitting in a pool of water. That's like not possible. Elijah just saw it with his own eyes. And that fast, what does he have to be afraid of? One person? One person makes a threat to kill him? Keep in mind this person, we're talking about Jezebel here. Jezebel's closest followers, Jezebel's most like influential, powerful people were the 850 false prophets. What just happened to them last chapter? They died. What does Elijah have to be afraid of? And it's so easy for us to read the story and look at it and count up those facts and say, man, Elijah, what are you so afraid of, man? But I've been there. When I start chasing the approval of people, when I start chasing the affirmation of people, when I start so badly wanting people to be impressed, when I start so badly wanting people to like what I'm doing, when I start so badly wanting to fit in, all that faith that I had up on the mountain, turns to fear just like that. So where's your approval come from? Because if you want this faith, if you want this fire in you, if you want the change that started last night to continue, your approval can't come from people. Your approval's got to come just from the one place it counts, the God who can send fire from heaven. And the change that's starting this week is just a first step, you know that? It's just a first step. You're getting started. God's showing up. God's calling you. God's drawing you. He's calling you into a life of obedience to him. He's calling you into a life of submission to him. Where does your approval come from? If you're trying to please him, your faith will be strong. If you're trying to please people, your faith will turn to fear. Let's keep reading. So in verse 5, it says, He lay down under the bush. He fell asleep. Then it says, All at once an angel touched him and said, Get up and eat. He looked around, and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then lay down again. You guys remember, just real fast, from yesterday morning, when Elijah was with that widow in Zarephath, and she didn't have any food, and God miraculously provided it. You remember what God provided? Flour to make bread and water. 
I don't think it's coincidence that God shows up here and says, Elijah, you're in despair. Elijah, you don't think anything's going to change. Elijah, you lost your hope. You lost your faith. Did you forget what I'm capable of? And I wonder how often Elijah's banking on this fire from heaven thing and he goes from one extreme down in the valley to the other. And God says, I know you just saw something incredible. That didn't work. Elijah, do you remember bread and water? Do you remember that faithful daily provision of God? And I think when Elijah tasted it, he didn't just taste bread and water. I think when Elijah tasted it, he remembered three years ago for him when he was in that little town of Zarephath and God showed up in a way he never could have guessed. And I bet he tastes that bread and he drinks that water and thinks, I remember. I remember. So bread and water, he eats. Verse 7, the angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. In other words, you just won't have enough physical strength if you try to do this by yourself. Can I just give you that reminder real fast? Hey, students, you don't have enough strength to do this by yourself. The journey God's calling you to is too much for you. You make sure you stay sustained. You make sure you stay plugged into community. This journey is too much for you. Verse 8, so he got up and ate and drank, strengthened by that food. He traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. There he went into a cave and spent the night. You know, another name for Horeb, that mountain Horeb, is Mount Sinai. Does that sound familiar to some of you? Mount Sinai is where Moses encountered the power of God, where Moses got the Ten Commandments. You know what I think Elijah's doing? I think Elijah's chasing another mountaintop. He was up on Mount Carmel and saw the power of God and the thunder and the lightning and the fire. And he's like, man, I... I'm just afraid now. I don't know if it's going to last anymore. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know if I can trust it. And then he tastes this bread. He's like, oh yeah, I remember God is real. But you know what I need? I need more than just daily sustenance. I need more than just the next step. I want more than just faithfully following one day, one step after the next. I want to chase another huge experience. I'm going to go to Mount Sinai where I know God shows up. And I'm going to hope he comes in a powerful way because I just need, I just need another huge thing. Anybody feel that way every summer? You come back to CIY and think, man, I just need another huge, I just need that, that huge mountaintop. Sometimes God does that. We meet God up here. We meet God up on the mountain. But sometimes when you're stuck, when you're afraid, when you're back off track, what you need isn't another mountaintop so that you come back off the mountain into another valley. Sometimes what you need is, hey, remember God provides for you every day. Sometimes what you need is, hey, remember that small, faithful step of obedience. Sometimes what you need is, hey, you don't need to change the world tomorrow. You need to love your classmate tomorrow. (laughs) Hey, you don't need to do everything right now. You just need to be faithful today. Sometimes I think we need those little reminders. Sometimes I think we need the bread and water more than we need the mountain. You with me? And I think God is calling Elijah. I think God is trying to draw Elijah. I think God is trying to tell Elijah, hey, I'll show up on the mountain. God's a God of the mountain. He shows up on mountains. But I think sometimes God is saying, hey, I'll meet you on the mountain. But I'd rather just meet you every day. I'd rather just meet you every day. And so here's here's what I want to challenge you with, what I want to leave you with today. Is that sometimes what what we don't need is to chase God to another mountaintop. Sometimes what we don't need is to chase another huge experience. Sometimes what we need is just to remember the God who's never left. Just to remember the God who's always been faithful. Sometimes what we need is just a little bread and a little water and take the next step. So I might, I might say it this way. I might say it this way. God's work in the past can be your hope for the future. God's work in the past can be your hope for the future. If you want to continue following God, if you want last night for some of you to be the beginning of a new journey of following him completely, then last night's not the end. Last night's the beginning. If you want to follow God on this life, if you want to remember what it's like up on the mountain without having to chase another mountain, then sometimes just what you need is to remember he's never left. He's never stopped. And he can give you bread and water just as good as he can give you fire from heaven. You know, for me, uh, some of these things, I, I have like tangible reminders of God's goodness. 
uh, just like I think Elijah sees this bread and it's like a real reminder to him that God showed up. I have like real tangible reminders of God's power, God's presence. Uh, I, I, my daughter uh, is four, four and a half. Uh, it's just the sweetest thing. Uh, she loves picking flowers and it's precious. She'll like, she'll pick flowers and like, you know, she holds them so tight uh, and just squishes them, you know. But then she'll give them and it's, it's the most precious gift. Like this squished up little flower precious. I have dried up little squished up flowers on the dashboard of my car that I'm going to keep there as long as I can because they remind me of my little girl who loves me. They remind me of my little girl who had a really, really rough first year and God brought her through it. And now I've got a four-year-old girl. And I see that little flower and I remember. I don't need God to show up on a mountain with fire tomorrow. What I need to remember is that God showed up four years ago with my little girl. I have a on my, on my Bible, I have the date July 1st, 2003 inscribed into it. That's the day when I was at a CIY conference and God called me to ministry. I don't need God to call me to ministry again. I need to remember God's voice in the past. And that's going to be my hope for the future. That's going to be my strength for the future. Listen, you don't always need a new mountain. Sometimes you just need to remember the bread and water. God's work in the past can be your hope for the future. So don't forget those little things. Hey, listen, when you despair... And when you feel like you're ready to give up, when you feel like you're ready to fold, when you're up on the mountain hiding under the shade of a broom tree just saying, God, I want to quit. I'm tired. I'm stuck. I'm afraid. Don't give up hope. Because when you despair, when you're in that moment in the desert under the tree trying to hide, sometimes it's those moments when God's voice is the loudest. And when you're tempted to quit in your despair, God will sustain you. And sometimes that's the moment where he wants to draw you close and whisper in your ear the next step. Are you listening?